over to Mark, Mark chapter 15. I took an informal poll. Um, most things I do are very informal. But I asked a couple fathers whether they wanted to have a Father's Day sermon or carry on a mark, and they both, and they all both. I said it was more than both. There was more. <laughs> there were like four of them, and they all said, carry on a mark. We don't want a Father's Day. I guess they've been beat up by Father's Day sermons at one time or the other. I will try to carry on their wishes. Um, we're going to do a little bit of both. We're in Mark chapter 15. We're going to talk about the burial of Jesus. Last week we talked about the death of Jesus. But there is a section here that I want you to, uh, to notice because we have been pointing out everything in Mark that is unique to Mark. Things that make us understand why Mark wrote what he wrote, who he wrote it to. And what we have is um, somebody who is very unique in the book of Mark. In uh, chapter 15, if you look at verse 23, so a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now, Cyrene is in Africa. It's in the north of Africa. This is somebody who made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. That's all we know really about him. He was from Cyrene. Simon, you know, I, I don't know, we, we talked about names this morning up here. That's a name you don't hear very often anymore. Simon? Is that because the Simon says this? I don't know. But anyway, that, that name went out of vogue. We have two other names here, though, that are unique to the book of Mark. Simon was a father. He had two sons. Rufus, there's a name. How many of you named your kids Rufus? I don't know why that one went out of vogue. Alexander, that one's still used. Matter of fact, one of my sons, his middle name is Alexander. Why is that interesting? Mark's audience must have known Rufus and Alexander. They must have known who these guys were. Matter of fact, there's a Rufus in, uh, in the, the end of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 16. It's probably the same guy. How many Rufuses are there? Okay. But what an amazing thing. Can you imagine saying, my dad, my dad carried the cross for Jesus. Now Simon, he didn't volunteer, okay? He didn't volunteer because the, the Romans had a thing, if they, if they reached over with their spear and touched you with the flat of their spear, you were indentured. You were going to do something for them. They could only make you go a mile. But they could make you do certain things. And at this point, Jesus was too weak to carry his cross. We don't know if it was the full cross or if it was just the, the cross beam. It's possible that they had the uprights already there and they were just carrying the cross beam. But Jesus couldn't carry it anymore. So this man was indentured in his service. And he carried the cross for Jesus. Now, the one thing we do know is his sons became believers. I think about Father's Day. The things that you're proud of, of your father. Can you imagine saying, my, my father carried the cross for Jesus when, when he couldn't do it. All of us have things we're proud of in our fathers. I think about my father. I think about the things that he did for me. And I'm like, <clears throat> okay. A lot of things I'm proud of for my dad. He used to go and preach at these little churches that, that were too small to have their own minister. He used to take us with him. And we used to get to lead singing. Can you imagine that, Brent? <laughs> That's why these churches were too small to have their ministers. So I used to lead singing with my dad. Now. <clears throat> yeah. My dad used to buy things so we could have experiences like you know, secondhand trailers, secondhand boats, just so we can learn these kind of things. I remember him taking us hunting when I was, I could barely, I mean, keep up. He was bow hunting for elk, and there's no way he would have been successful because there were three of us trailing behind and making all kinds of noise. But I'll never forget that. The most, the thing I'm most proud about my dad is when I was 
18 and I told him I felt like I had a call to ministry and that I wanted to be a minister, he didn't laugh. And he didn't try to talk me out of it. Did he encourage me and talked about the plans, where to go to school, what to do. And that's what I remember most. And I'm proud of the most about my dad. <clears throat> Sorry. I got my father-in-law here this morning. I'm very proud of my father-in-law. He's given us so much good advice, so much support, so much generosity. But what I'm proudest the most about my father-in-law is when I called him and told him that I loved his daughter and that I wanted to marry her and I asked for his permission, he didn't laugh at me. <laughs> the stonemason from Colorado, that he gave me his blessing and he's been supportive every bit of the way ever since that and I, I'm very proud of him for that. And I imagine you think of things that you're proud of from your, your father. Maybe you can, if your father's still alive, you can tell him, this is why I'm very proud of you. And, and maybe you think about what you want to be, your kids to be proud of about you today. At any rate, enough of that. We're back in Mark, okay? <laughs> so we're going to talk about somebody else who um, did some pretty amazing things, and I'm sure that their children were proud of them. We've seen in the book of Mark that Jesus has been in control. From the beginning, he has been in control. He has decided that he is going to make the sacrifice for us. We talked about how we are the joy that was set before him. The reason he endured the cross. And he made this happen. But now that he's on the cross, and he's died, and he's died in a way that nobody else has ever seen. The centurion was fascinated with the way the man died. Now he's no longer in control. At this point, he's dead. The text says, in verse 42, it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother, mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. It was almost the Sabbath. It's a big Sabbath after Passover. And you didn't want people hanging around. It just wasn't the right atmosphere. And so normally what they did was make sure that they all died by this point. And we didn't talk much in detail about the crucifixion, but what you die of from the crucifixion is asphyxiation. You quit breathing. You can no longer push yourself up enough to fill your lungs. Jesus died in a matter of less than a day. It shows you how stressed his body was. Now what to do to hurry somebody along is you go and you break their legs. When you break their legs, they can't push themselves anymore. They can't breathe. They die. And they went out to break Jesus' legs, and they found that he was already dead. Mercifully, they put a, side, a spear in his side and saw that the blood and the water separated, and he was, in fact, already dead, and so they didn't break his legs. Pilate was surprised. He's already dead. Yeah, he's dead. So what do we do with his body now? There's been a field bought. Remember the money that, Joseph, that Judas threw back in? They said, hey, you know, we can't use this money in the temple anymore. It's blood money. And they bought a pauper's field 